Okay, thank you. Welcome, everyone, and welcome to uh, to those of you who are joining us online. Uh, my name is Ed Aspinall, and I'll be chairing uh, the meeting today. Uh, and it's with great pleasure that I welcome to the ANU Professor Simon Butt uh, from the University of Sydney, where he is the director of the Centre for Asian and Pacific Law. Um, Simon is one of those people we're very privileged to have working in the field of Indonesian studies in Australia, so it's great to have him here. He's an absolute uh, world-leading specialist on Indonesian law uh, and also Indonesian law within its broader social and political context. He's a very prolific researcher. I author or co-author of five books, is that correct? I think so. Something like that, he shrugs. Um, with one more coming out, and it's the topic of uh, his uh, forthcoming research in his new book, Judicial Dysfunction in Indonesia, um, which for those of you who are here, there are a few flyers at the front, so you can order a copy with a uh, discount. Um, and I'll repeat the title for those of you online, Judicial Dysfunction in Indonesia, forthcoming with University Press. So uh, this book uh, covers, well, like it says on the cover, I suppose, um, issues to do with um, the problematic character of the judiciary in Indonesia, including corruption. So Simon will speak for about 45 minutes, uh, and then we will do questions and answers after that. So thanks, Simon. Thank, Thank you. Me. Thanks, Ed, for inviting me along. And uh, well, it's good to be back. I did my undergraduate law and Asian studies degrees here, and it's always um, fantastic to to be invited to to come back to my to my roots. And thank you, Ed, for all your support over the years as well. And it's lovely to see a few uh, familiar faces in the uh, in the audience. So yes, as Ed said, um, this um, talk today uh, is about judicial corruption in Indonesia. And it's one of the themes that I, I look at in my forthcoming book, Judicial oh, Dysfunction in Indonesia. And there are lots of other aspects of judicial dysfunction beyond corruption that perhaps we can pick up um, in the discussions after the after my talk. But it's just one chapter in, uh, I think, 10 on, uh, on the courts and how I argue they're not performing pretty well. Uh, what I wanted to to start with, though, is my my connected. Do I press? Do I press? Side to side, these sideways buttons. Yeah. I thought I'd start with the. Oh yeah. Still not going. I wanted to, I suppose, preempt some of the discussion that I anticipated that we would have um, uh, in relation to uh, some of the recent events that have occurred in Indonesia. Um, and that in particular is the recent decision of the Constitutional Court, um, which enabled Jokowi's son. Gibran to run as Prabowo's uh, vice presidential running mate. And as many of you will have read, um, in fact, there's an article that's just come out in the conversation that I wrote with um, Tim Lindsay on, about this decision. Thank you. There are a lot of strange things about the decision. Now, this is not covered in my book because obviously it's already in press and this case came out last, last Monday. Um, but Article 169Q of the 2017 electoral law says that candidates for presidential or vice presidential office must be at least 40 years old. Now, in this decision that came out last week, the court basically changed that article to include these words, unless the candidate has experience in elected office uh, including as in a regional uh, regional head position. Now, this decision went against a number of decisions in which the court has refused to change statutory age limits 
or to make exceptions. And previous cases, the Constitutional Court has said, well, the Constitution itself doesn't impose any age limits, and so the parliaments, the Parliament, the National Parliament can can impose whatever limits it likes. In fact, I suppose there's always been a credible constitutional argument, you know, upon which the, the court could change limits, um, one that the court has, in fact, accepted in other types of cases, uh, and that is that the Constitution sets out a democratic system um, and people should be able to choose whoever they want as their leaders, regardless of their age. So democratic or democracy should override uh, any policy restrictions that Parliament might impose. That argument had been made um, in other cases and has exceed, succeeded in other cases before the Constitutional Court. The second problem, and this is the one that created headlines, was that in the morning on last Monday, the court read out three decisions about precisely the same provision of the electoral law uh, where it held that the court would not intervene, would not um, make an exception. Yet by the afternoon, when it read out this decision, the court seems to have changed its mind. So let's look at these points. Um, in the first three cases that the court may read out in the morning, there were six judges in favour of uh, of, uphold, of of leaving the, the limit in, and there were two judges that dissented. Now, one judge dissented on a bit of a technicality. Um, um, Suhari, Suharto, Suhartoyo, Suhartoyo, Suhartoyo. He, he descended on the on the basis that he thought that the person bringing the claim before the Constitutional Court didn't have standing. We can leave him to one side. It's a bit of a, a technical point. The other judge who dissented in the morning, who who would have who wanted to uh, kind of impose this exception or include this exception, was a judge by the name of Guntur Hamza, and some of you may be familiar with this judge, or at least his name, I'll come back to discuss that. But essentially, he says, well, other countries have um, much younger uh, candidates. We've got um, quite a number of, of countries around the world with young prime ministers or presidents. Indonesia used to have a limit uh, below 40. So this is a new imposition. Um, Indonesia's population is quite young, and he pointed to BPS statistics you know, showing how many Indonesians fell into the under 40 age bracket and said, well, it's unfair to restrict these people from standing for presidential or vice presidential office and to prevent people from voting for, for people uh, that they think would represent them, the, the youth of Indonesia. Uh, and so for these reasons, Guntur Hamza said, well, you know, we should allow, we should get rid of this 40-year restriction, 40-year age restriction. Now, Guntur Hamza, I think, wrote probably a credible decision here. It was, there were points that he made that were quite valid, um, obviously disagreed with the six other judges on the panel. But this judge is the one who the DPR earlier this year, late last year, earlier this year, um, decided to uh, to replace Justice Aswanto with. So you may recall very controversially um, the National Parliament decided to remove a constitutional court judge and was very open about the fact that it was because it or the judge had um, decided cases that in a way that the government didn't like, that the National Parliament didn't like. And so Guntor was the person who replaced Aswanto uh, here. So that was problematic in itself because that's the job of a constitutional court judge. It's to, he, he or she is to, you know, decide to invalidate or um, kind of remove statutory provisions that it thinks, that, or he or she thinks are contrary to the constitution. That's all that Aswanto was doing in that case, but he got removed for doing his job, but maybe we could talk about that in the in the discussion later too. 
Now, the significance of Guntur's judgment in the morning was that by the afternoon, four more constitutional court judges had basically sided with his view. And you can read the constitutional court decision. I think it's probably the most lengthy, re you know, reasoned judgment that I've read of the constitutional court. It's about 100 pages of actual judicial um, reasoning. Normally you see 20 pages or so, sometimes 30 or 40. Um, so I think it's one of its biggest decisions. And it had not just four dissenting judges, but four separate dissenting opinions. And in the majority, we had five judges. Three gave a joint opinion and then two gave concurring opinions. So these are all things that we associate with um, the common law system, I think it's fair to say. So we're seeing a, a court split um, and along different lines, more than in any other case that I can think of. So four judges sided with, or seemed to switch to side with Guntur, and four judges held firm with their decision that they made earlier on in the morning. The bizarre, oh, Indonesia is great like this, isn't it? But one of the interesting points is that Arif Hidayat, who's been long associated um, with being a kind of DPR loyalist, or as a DPR loyalist. In fact, he was taken to the Constitutional Court's Honour Council um, for meeting with parliamentarians in secret a few years back. He was one of the dissenting judges. And in fact, a lot of what he had to say in his opinion was um, quite controversial. Some would say went beyond what he was allowed to disclose to the public. So... Of course, the big problem with this decision um, is, apart from the fact that the, you know we had contrary decisions um, on the uh, in the morning to the afternoon, was that judges met twice to um, decide these cases. So it meant they met on the nineteenth of September to discuss the three morning cases, and two days later on the twenty first of September to discuss the. Uh, the, the afternoon case where the, um, the exception to the 40-year age limit was, was made. Um, and, of course, the controversial aspect here is that, sorry, that was Guntur and that was Anwar Usman, the, the Chief Justice. The controversial aspect here is that the Chief Justice uh, also happens to be Jacobi's brother-in-law and the uncle of Gibran. He's the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court. And so, of course, you know, the controversy was, well, why didn't he recuse himself? Why didn't he withdraw himself from the case when he obviously had a family connection to someone with an interest in the outcome? He's only one judge on the court, though, right? There's nine judges on the court. So what's the big deal about him not recusing himself. I mean, there are plenty of other judges on the court that could have um, kind of, you know, if there was enough um, support in the court for maintaining the age limit, you know, his view perhaps is not particularly important. Well, according to one of the judges in the decision that he wrote, Saldi Isra, who's quite a well-known good guy judge, Usman didn't participate in the meeting to discuss the three cases that were read out in the morning, on Monday morning last week. But he did attend two days later to decide the case involving um, well, what we wish the, the court read in the afternoon, which um, um, removed this 40-year restriction. Now, it's a bit unclear from the judgment, but Saldi Isra talks about how everyone presumed he didn't turn up on the 19th because he, he had a conflict of interest because everyone knew that um, Gibran uh, was being thought of um, as the vice president, vice president presidential running mate for Proboa, or the Proboa was considering um, nominating him or using him. But on the 21st of September, Usman did the, the Chief Justice did attend the meeting. And Saudi Isra says that at that meeting, Usman said, well, I didn't 
turn up on the 19th, not because I had a conflict of interest, but because of Alassan Kazatan or my health. It was a health problem. Didn't disclose what that health problem was. So he doesn't turn up at the, uh, at the earlier meeting, age limit maintained, turns up at the later meeting, the decision that's reached there is to kind of make an exception to that age limit. Now, if he did recuse himself, as he probably should have, then the court would have been evenly split. But he seems instead to have been able to turn the views of the, the four judges that switched and had the casting vote. So... Um, his attendance seems to have been quite material here. And all, as, as you'll know, um, this all paved the, the way for the announcement of Gibran as Brabo's vice presidential candidate. Now, this unfortunately seems to be the last nail, or I don't know how many nails are left, to go in the coffin of the Constitutional Court. Um uh, I've, I've written a book on the Constitutional Court, and this, and I'm planning to update it with you know cases that have occurred in the last ten years. But now I'm starting to question whether there's much point in doing this because the court seems to be quite dead. Um, I presume people will still keep um, bringing applications to the court to publicise issues of public importance, but I can't see it giving a decision that goes against the the ruling. Uh, elite anymore. We'll see there may be some kind of blips on the radar, but it's not looking great for this court. Um, and this is Saldi Isra, the dissenting judge. He's facing disciplinary hearings because he disclosed in his decision what happened in the Rapat Pramusha Waratan Hakim, the judge's deliberation meeting. And that's supposed to be strictly confidential. Um, but, of course, he's one of the dissenting judges holding firm on the court's position over the years. I've also heard that Denny Indriana, the famous, um, well, almost governor, um, but um, former deputy minister uh, of law and human rights, um, has also brought a challenge or, or some kind of proceedings against the judges who are in the, the majority um, in that case. But I don't know quite what the... The thinking is there. Really, the, the problem should be, or the focus should be on the conflict of, of interest that the Chief Justice has or had, but um, we'll see how these things pan out. All right. Oh, sorry. I should just, that's uh, another good little. Um, Adas meninganya integritas makama constitusi producachita. All right. So this is um, my um, book. Um, and it focuses on judicial um, processes and their corruption, um, um, if not by undue influence, then by cold, hard cash. Now, it's got a bit of a provocative, provocative title, but I think it accurately describes the performance of the Indonesian judiciary. And part of its focus is on corruption. Well, I don't know if any of you have been to an Indonesian district court recently, but if you have, you may have been surprised to hear an announcement over the court's sound system. And if you, if you were there for long enough, you might have heard it more than once. And the text of the announcement, which the Supreme Court has, be, has mandated to be read, is as follows. Requesting your attention for an announcement from the leadership of the court to all litigants and their families and all visitors to the court, please help us at the court to behave cleanly by not contracting judges, registrar, registrars, deputy registrars, bailiffs and all court personnel so they don't receive a tip, payment, bribe, gift or promise in any form. And if there is someone who claims to act on behalf of a judge, registrar, deputy registrar, bailiff or employee to receive a request or receive a tip, payment, bribe, gift or promise in any form, please immediately report this to the KPK, the Anti-Corruption Commission, BAWAS, the uh, internal supervisory body in the Supreme Court, or the Chief Justice of the District Court. 
Now, this is a, as I said, a mandated um, set of words, form of words that must be read out, I think, every two hours in courts, in district courts in Indonesia. Uh, it's described as part of, this is in a formal document that, that imposes this obligation on district courts, as a public campaign of the courts to control gratification and which demonstrates the commitment of the court leadership to judicial integrity. And the circular, uh, this is a no more, uh, tahun 2019, also requires judges to read out a very similar announcement at the beginning of each hearing. Um, now, you may find it a bit strange that a court, a Supreme Court, would require all of the judges under it to read out such an announcement every two hours. But I think the strangest thing about it is that it seems to put the onus on parties to not contact judges or court staff rather than require court staff and judges not to take bribes. And that's the startling thing about it. But it also, of course, contains an implicit admission, doesn't it? That the Supreme Court itself recognises that this is such a problem that it needs to do something about it. Whether or not this is the solution is another, another point, another question. Now, most people uh, would say, most people who have... Um, and been involved in looking at Indonesia over the years um, would, would, would recognise that corruption is a problem in Indonesian courts as it is in other areas of Indonesian activity. Um, but many would say that it's probably gotten worse uh, over the last decade or two. But claims about the problem of judicial corruption in Indonesia um, haven't been supported by much evidence. As far as I can tell, most accounts have been almost purely anecdotal. You hear rumours, discussions with lawyers. Most of the time, those lawyers are complaining when they lost a case, so you've got to take those types of complaints with a, with a grain of salt. Um, most probably feel more aggrieved about the outcome. Uh, and the media has talked a lot about judicial corruption over the years. Particularly significant have been uh, um, admissions by judges, particularly senior judges who have said, yes, there's a real problem with judicial corruption, usually just before or after they've retired. They come out and kind of say, yes, it's a problem. But they really don't, I think, um, give us much explanation about the nature of the problem or its extent. One of the really important pieces of research, um, which tries, I think, to do this, tries to provide a bit more of a, um, a solid basis for these claims about judicial corruption, is the interview-based research performed by Indonesia Corruption Watch. I think 2001 it was. Now, it was an important piece of, of research. Um, it was um, you know, based on, I think, about 300 interviews with police, prosecutors, judges, litigants across six parts of Indonesia, six um, cities. Uh, and it painted a pretty damning picture of what's referred to as the judicial mafia, mafia pradila, which is in fact a, a, a term coined by a former chief justice of the Supreme Court. Then we had this, and this is an important report um, published in 2010 called Mafia Hukum Modus Operandi Akar Permasalaan dan Strategi Penanggulangan. Now, this was the report produced by a task force established by President S.B. Ye in 2009. And it had some pretty big figures on it, including Denny Indriana, but also um, a whole lot of other well-known and respected legal figures. Now, this was a body established by the president. And to be fair, if you read it, it picks up a lot of the themes that had already been identified in ICW's report. There's actually not much new um, in Mafia, in, in my, my view at least. 
But the, the fact that it was produced by a presidential team gave it some weight. And I don't think it's a coincidence that soon after this report was released and the Mafia uh, Bradilan task force you know, ex explained its findings publicly, that the KPK began targeting judges. Now, um, this was, I suppose you could say, a KPK at around the peak of its powers, 2010, uh, and for the for a few years after. And during that period, 27 judges were found guilty of corruption by Indonesian courts. Now, before this, it's very, 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 very rare for a judge to be found guilty. Um, there may have been disciplinary hear hearings behind the scenes that the Supreme Court held. Um, so you kind of come down on errant judges, but the Supreme Court itself was widely regarded to be very corrupt. Uh, and so it very rarely did anything about judicial corruption, uh, more likely to participate in it. So these um, reports identified the entry points of corruption. Um, and one of them was case registration. You go to court with a with a case, um, you want to sue someone, and you know the, the the official might take an unofficial bribe or fee to register your case, but more sinisterly might take a fee to ensure that your case goes to a judge that the court official knows might be receptive to a bribe. So this is all in the in the presidential task force's report. Um, then you have um, panel selection. There might, a bribe might be paid for uh, a, um, a panel of judges or to appoint a panel of judges in order uh, or that will be receptive to, to pay it, to, to receive a, a bribe to help fix the outcome. Then, of course, you've got bribes to um, fix actual decisions. Uh, there's a bit of discussion in these reports about who uh, initiates contact between the parties, whether it's judges that do it or parties that do it. It's probably a combination of both. Um, some refer to the, um, uh, the process as like an auction. So if you go to a judge with one decision that you want, the judge might go to the other party and say, well, what would you offer for a different decision? And so... Um, there's a kind of bargaining process, an auctioning process that uh, that eventuates. And then you've got after the decision where it's very, well, it's not unknown, there are quite, a, quite a few notorious cases where judges change the writing of the decision after it's been read out in open court. And then, of course, you have the really curly problem, which is something that we need to focus on more often in relation to Indonesian legal reform, which is the enforcement of judgments. So you've got a piece of paper favouring you in your hand. And you want to try and um, get that enforced against the other party, the losing party, or well, you often have to go to court all over again for an order of enforcement. Um, so that's a, a problem too. Uh, often bribes required there, as, as well as a bribe to police or any other agency you might need to use to... Um, to uh, uh, enforce the decision. So in my book, I look at all of the judicial corruption cases on the Supreme Court database. Um, and this is the Supreme Court database. Um, <clears throat> so it's more than 8 million cases on the database. And what that figure doesn't tell you is that a lot of them are dead links. Um, but, you know, still, there, it's a, it's a, the Supreme Court probably rightly says that it hosts more judicial decisions on its database than any other court in the world. So we've come a long way since what, the early 2000s when, which is the last time you really actually needed to go to a bookshop and buy compilations of judicial decisions or go to courts and obtain them. Um, they're very readily available now. Not complete. Um, the Indonesian judicial system itself produces about six, I think, six million cases a year. 
So it's far from complete, but it's pretty good. And it contains um, all the cases that I use to base my analysis on in the book. Now, what do I say about this as a data source to try and help explain the nature of judicial corruption in Indonesia? Well, they're all sanctioned by the Supreme Court in the sense that they are posted on the Supreme Court's website. Like you'd expect in any judicial decision, there's a discussion of the evidence. So you get to read all of the evidence that the KPK could, could accumulate against the judges that are prosecuted. So you get to read witness testimony. Um, you get to read what the court decided after considering all the evidence, what it found to have been proven, and then some reasons as to why the court might have reached its, um, its verdict in that case. So you've got, you've got a much more, or I think at least, concrete um, um, basis to make claims about what happens in judicial corruption or what happens in, you know, in terms of judicial corruption in Indonesia beyond those anecdotal reports. Now, a long way of of um, uh, 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 sorry, to, to kind of circumvent the, the, the um, a long discussion about this. A lot of the findings that were made in the earlier research uh, is confirmed by reading these judicial decisions. So, from these twenty seven or so cases, who were the judges that were found guilty of corruption? Well, they came from almost all branches of the Indonesian courts, uh, all the lower courts, high courts, Supreme Court, more recently, so that doesn't get in the book, but, but and constitutional court. So there were cases involving judges accepting bribes uh, in relation to land transactions, share transfers, bankruptcy applications, industrial relations matters, constitutional disputes, electoral disputes. But more judges were convicted for receiving a bribe to reduce a sentence or acquit a defendant in corruption cases than for any other type of case. That's why I've got a picture of well, uh, it, it, it's a case where one corruption case that I looked at occurred. But just to emphasise the fact that it's in corruption cases themselves that we see judicial corruption most prevalent. And interestingly, in all of the cases that I read, there were no acquittals on appeal. So a judge gets convicted at the Pangadalan degree, the district court level, <laughs> And that conviction is inevitably upheld on, um, on appeal and then on cassation to the Supreme Court. So in no case that I'm aware at least of, of at least was a judge acquitted. Sometimes the sentence was in fact increased as the case went up the judicial chain. Other times it was reduced. But mostly it was increased, particularly if a judge by the name of Artijo Alcosta was on the panel of Supreme Court judges. So he was a, the late judge, Judge uh, Justice Alcosta was known as a kind of reformist judge that really wanted to come down on, on corruption. We can talk a bit about him um, later on if you'd like as well, because I think he gets a bit more credit than he deserves. But anyway, we can talk about that. So this is the biggest corruption case, I think it's fair to say, so far. This is Akhil Mokhtar, former Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court, and he was found guilty of taking very large bribes to fix nine electoral disputes, uh, all while he was serving as the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court. Now, I'll put this picture up here. I know it's hard to see because of the, the, um, the, the writing here, but when he was appointed to the court, um, a lot was made of the fact that he'd written in his academic career about corruption eradication. 
So that's his book there. Pembrantas Krupsi. Uh, uh, he's, he's an expert on, on the reversal of the burden of proof in corruption cases, if you're interested. Uh, but of course, um, he was found guilty uh, himself of, of, of doing this. So the great thing about these cases, I mean, his case is a really long one to, to read, but you get the, some of the nitty gritty of, of what he was said to have, have done, what bribe, what form the bribes took, etc. So, you know, the currency, Indonesian rupiah, Singaporean dollars, US dollars, um, you know, contained in envelopes, plastic bags, and travel bags, usually through intermediaries. Um, so they'd often be, in his case, assistance from a court registrar, and then perhaps the family or a friend or even a lawyer of the, the party that was trying to pay the bribe. Quite famously, um, Mokhtar received some of his bribes in a, a, a box, an Indomie noodle box, which Mokhtar and others implicated in the case referred to as fish cakes or empeng. And at his trial, I'm not making this up, Akhil Mokhtar said, in fact, the box was full of fish cakes and there was no money in it, um, but the court rejected that claim. Um, he also was found to have received, and this I suppose goes to a bit of judicial brazenness, money in the account of a business called Ratu Samagat, uh, which was in his wife's name. Uh, it was a company that he had established with her as a director and one of his children, I think, uh, as deputy director. Uh, and that's uh, an account into which um, some of the bribes that weren't cash were, were paid. So quite easy to trace it back to him um, by anyone who's looking anywhere near closely. Um, and again, I know it's terrible to make light, yes, five minutes, to make light of these types of um, of cases, but Akhil Mokhtar was um, uh, found to have attempted to disguise some of the bribes um, on various bank slips as building of a fish pool. So we'd give a receipt for building of a fish pool, trans transportation of coconut meat, um, purchase of, of coconut seeds. And at trial, he said, well, those, the money that was coming in to these bank accounts were in fact for those services. But again, the court decided that that was uh, kind of not feasible um, and the evidence um, kind of suggested otherwise. Now he's never accepted um, that he's done any of these things, he's always maintained his innocence. But again, but the case transcripts really quite interesting reading. There were over 1,100 pieces of evidence, including SMS messages, transcribed telephone conversations, bank transfers, and receipt records. It included testimony of over 100 witnesses. So the KPK did a pretty good job on him. There are a number of other cases that uh, I could talk about. I'm running out of time. There's um, this case involving a lawyer, O.C. Kalik, is one of Indonesia's more famous lawyers. I think he was a, a, a Sahato's go-to lawyer for a while. Um, cracked a, a couple of um, milestones in terms of fees charged to clients, um, which I won't go into. But um, he was found guilty of travelling several times and attempting several times with his associates to bribe judges in, in Medan who continually refused him until eventually one judge had just had enough, I think on the fourth or fifth meeting with him and, and just didn't hand back the envelope and put it in his cupboard, uh, envelope of cash, and that was enough for, uh, for him to be convicted of, of corruption. There are some great cases involving judges as in-betweens or go-betweens, I should say. So this case um, involved judges in Samarang um, and um, uh, a judge from a different court who had a connection to one of the parties that defended in a corruption case uh, 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 was used to, to try and bribe 
the Samarang judge. So using the, the judge from another corruption court uh, as your way in to bribe uh, a judge in Samara in this corruption case. Um, I just want to get to to this one because a couple of quite interesting cases um, before I finish. One is this um, idea of payment in kind. Now, um, <clears throat> One of the other Supreme Court judges to be convicted of corruption, Patri Ali's Akbar, was found to have received all sorts of gifts, including um, kind of golf uh, payment of golf fees and, and things like that. Um, another judge was found to have accepted a, com a combination for a few nights in a hotel in Jakarta, quite a cheap hotel actually, um, but still that was enough to constitute corruption. This is the most... Um, uh, soul-destroying um, example of payment in kind. Now, this was a case involving Bandung anti-corruption court judges. Setia Budi and Ramalan Komel were their names. And the main way that they were bribed was through um, the payment of expenses at the Venetian Havana Spa Lounge and Karaoke. And apparently, according to the case transcript, Setia Budi and Komel, uh, you know, allegedly engaged with regular sex with, with prostitutes. And this all came out in the trial. So quite humiliating for, for the judges. Um, and I know I shouldn't say this is very salacious of me, but uh, one of the witnesses, the guy who accompanied the two judges to these um, venues, said that, the judges had been at the venue around a dozen times, with each visit costing about 25 million rupiah. And the witness says, I'm a player, but Setia Budi is wilder than me. So very salacious. Um, and just to finish, just to finish. <clears throat> so in, uh, one of the judges, I think it was the Band one of the Bandung um, anti-corruption anti court judges, was found to have engaged in corruption. One of the, she was he hearing a, a case involving a local government official in a corruption case. And one of the ways that she was allegedly paid was to increase the star rating of her family hotel from two <laughs> to three stars. Now, I've got no idea if this is definitely the hotel. It seems like it is, but. You see at the top, you can see there's three stars up there and two in there. So I presume this is the after bribe shot. shot. And of course, local government officials were within their power you know, to change star ratings of hotels. And uh, that's one of the ways that she was paid in this case. So I'm sorry, I had to, had to cut, cut short a lot of what I was going to say because I spent a lot of time talking about the constitutional court decision. Um, but hopefully you get a flavour for some of the judicial corruption prosecutions or prosecutions for judicial corruption um, in Indonesia in recent years. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Simon. And um, uh, if anyone has a question, please indicate and we can go through them. And that goes also for those of you who are online. Um, if you write a question into the chat uh, function, we can... No? Into the question and answer. Function. Into the question and answer function, uh, we can read it out from there. Uh, who would like to go first? And everyone, please introduce yourself to Simon. Hi, everyone. My name is Nadia Hamba. Student. You think it's following specific office in the constitutional court, just like the judiciary uh, reform task office or the Bumaro Camila in the Supreme Court. Uh, now we can answer the professional court problem. Mm, it's interesting. Um, I suppose in all courts in Indonesia, there are some good people and some bad people. Um, and one of the, the things I struggle with is trying to get a handle on the proportion of good judges, bad judges, you know, who's receptive to a bribe, who's not. I mean, how how widespread is is the problem? And you just we just don't know, right? I mean, there's 8,000 judges in Indonesia. We don't know what the proportions are. Again, we'd be relying on rumour and speculation. Some say 90%, others say 50%. We just don't know. 
So Gita's is right in the Supreme Court. There's a um, there's a a body which uh, is called the the, the the reform team. I was there last week actually in 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 the in the, in the Supreme Court, and there's some very good people there doing some really good important work with, with members of the Supreme Court that um, you know I might do some fantastic work. I would I would suggest in difficult circumstances, um, but there are some really good judges in the Supreme Court that work with Timpanbaruan and also with broader civil society. But the Supreme Court has fifty judges, and not all fifty judges you can categorise in that way. I think the same could be said for the Constitutional Court. So the Constitutional Court obviously has some new problems. They're not necessarily deep-seated and historical as they may be in the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court has a massive job of, of administering uh, it was like a thousand courts, 30,000 officials or more across the archipelago. And they got this job because after Sahato fell, it was thought that it would be better for the reasons of judicial independence to bring the administration of the court under the one roof of the Supreme Court. And a lot of what the Tim Bambaduan does actually relates not only to you know improving judicial standards, et cetera, et cetera, but also how the court should kind of administer all of these courts spread across the, the archipelago. Now, this, the Constitutional Court doesn't have that problem. It's a single court in Jakarta, nine judges. And many of its judges, a, a large proportion of its judges, I would suggest, over the years, have been really quite good. So at least comparatively, relatively to to other Indonesian judicial institutions. Now, I don't mean to be disparaging at all there. I mean, Saudi Isra in particular, um, I don't know what the court would be like without him on the bench, but there are others too. Um, even the, the founding chief justice, um, even so Jim Lee Asadiki, even Mahfoud MD, who's now um, coordinating minister, great. You know problems, but but you know, relatively speaking, really quite quite good. Um, so I'm not sure whether a Tikman Badawan could withstand the kind of political pressure that's being I uh, I think's being exerted on the court now in any event, but it has different problems to the Supreme Court. <laughs> and really, the other point to say, I suppose, about the Constitutional Court is that. There is a team of researchers behind the court, behind the judges, that, well, I mean, I know quite a few of them, and they're really, really very good. Um, now, they have to do what the, the judges tell them to do. They have to write what the judges tell them to write, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you can see how that might make a difference as well. So that might be, you know, helping. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if it would work. There's probably enough in the court already to to maintain the standard. It's just it's just literally the fear at the moment. Next questions. Go ahead. My name is Theo. I'm one of the PhD students. I like to ask uh, about your opinion about the judicial inconsistency because, like, we know this is like a classic problems of Indonesian court and. Uh, they will not run and also the other legal people already do a lot of things. But yes. It's only a matter of time. Yes, it's interesting. Um, so Indonesia's judicial system has long been um, known for producing inconsistent judgments in similar cases. And this has often been said to be um, the result of lack of sense sentencing guidelines, at least guidelines that all of the judges in all the courts are aware of. Um, also, people have often pointed to the fact that, you know, judicial decisions weren't available in Indonesia, so judges wouldn't be able to find out what other courts had decided in some of the cases anyway. Now, the database has kind of put that to rest, I suppose, but we still see lots of examples of inconsistencies. In my book, I spend about a chapter 
talking about the um, the sentencing guidelines that were established in corruption cases. Now, these were produced um, in collaboration with the with public prosecutors, and they set out how a judge should determine the sentence in any given case. So the you know, the amount of money that was corrupted, the, the scale of the problem, was it a, a broad um, problem that occurred across Indonesia? You know, was it systematic and planned? So it's all these kind of criteria that you put into this table. And based on a preliminary analysis that I, I did, I looked at uh, every high court judgment I could find on that database in which had applied, sorry, which had been an appeal against a decision that had or should have applied that sentencing matrix. I found that the High Court in almost all cases had, had imposed the matrix, so had enforced the matrix. So where a lower court hadn't made its decision, it's, it hadn't imposed a verdict in line with the matrix, the court overturned the sentence. So that was a really good sign. And it shows that sentencing guidelines, I, mean, I don't know what's happening now. I mean, this was research I did a year and a bit ago, so maybe it's changed, but the potential of the use of, of sentencing guidelines is 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 quite good. Um, but how, quite how you spread that across all cases and across all courts is another matter. Um, PhDs, I know, you know Rifki Asagaf, Rifki Asagaf, Rifki Asagaf wrote his PhD on on sentencing. Um, there's a there's a there's a bit of research about it, but it's still a major problem. Thank you. We have an online question. I'm going to read it out for you because it's quite a long one, yep. but it's lovely. It says, hello, Park Simon. Uh, thank you for your presentation today. I'm a big fan of your work. My name is Amelia and I'm a PhD candidate student at Melbourne Law School. My thesis is about the dismantling of Indonesia's anti-corruption commission since the 2019 amendments. Uh, my supervisors are Professor Tim Lindsay and uh, Associate Professor Amanda Whitey. I want to expand on your book, Corruption and Law in Indonesia, in my thesis, but my question to you is, have you witnessed a decline of investigations and prosecution of the judicial mafia since the 2019 legislative amendments to the KPK? Mm, yeah, good question. And I, look, I haven't, I haven't looked at this closely, but the answer is yes. Um, I, the cases that I've discovered in my searches of the database were all between 2010 and 2020. I don't think there's been another prosecution of a lower court judge since then, but there has been a prosecution of a Supreme Court judge and a number of Supreme Court staff. Um, and that case is still ongoing. I presume it's on appeal to the Supreme Court now, the Dimiati case. That case, the judge, and I won't go into the details of the, of the case itself, the judge got 13 years for corruption at the lowest level, at the district court level, but that was reduced, I think, to eight years on appeal because he'd spent 34 years as a judge. So for his service to the judiciary, he was given a five-year discount on his sentence which doesn't really send the right message to people involved in judicial corruption, does it? So, yes, there seemed to be a spate of... It seems to be that the KPK did focus on judicial corruption um, uh, uh, from 2010 after that Mafia Task Force uh, report, but since then I think it's slowed down. Another online question. Yeah, this one's from Owen Hodger. It says, thank you, Simon. Uh, your cases were of external corruption. Did you find any cases of internal corruption, for example, in promotions and transfers? Uh, yes. No, well, well, I wasn't looking for them. Um, they, well, if, if, if that had existed, um, then I would have expected to have found it in the corruption cases in the database. Um, but none of them, none of the cases I found involved that. Um, but of course, it's pretty widely known, suspected that promotions 
um, transfers, et cetera, are based on loyalty, not merit um, in the Supreme Court and in other courts. Um, and it's been like that for a long time. Uh, talking about the one roof reforms, well, it was often said during Sahado's regime that the courts were beholden to the government, that they were you know, trying to um, uh, placate their superiors in the Ministry of, of Law and Human Rights or Ministry of Justice, as it was called then. Um, and now the focus of attention, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, you need to impress the Supreme Court leadership um, in various various ways, um, not necessarily by quality decision making, I wouldn't think. So, you know, we probably do have a bit of a, of a system of patri patrimony in, uh, in the courts, just like we may have still in the bureaucracy. My question is about the database that you draw on. Yep. And, uh, it arises not so much from the discussion of the corruption cases, but about the guidelines. And I was wondering what sort of transparency there is about which decisions they choose to publish on uh, the database and how that might influence the types of conclusions you can draw on whether, for example, the guidelines are having a specific Yes, don't know. Um, that's a great question. It's possible that only the cases that the court wants to put up there are the cases that go up there. That said, it's responsible for courts and judicial standards, and it's put all of the judicial corruption cases that I could find up there. So, of course, I cross-referenced, um, cross-checked all the cases I found there with media reports, and I found no media reports. Uh, maybe there was one um, where there was a case been reported that wasn't on the database, either at the lower high court or the Supreme Court levels. So sometimes there were there were there were cases missing in the chain, but there was almost always a case at one level. So you could find out what the evidence was against the the defendant judge um, at, in any of those decisions in any event. Um, but yes, it, it's interesting because. One of the, the, the famous writers on the Indonesian judicial system, Sebastian Pomper, a Dutch scholar, um, wrote in his book about the Supreme Court, a study of in institutional collapse, the judges um, were basically asked, this is before the database, this is when it was still published on paper, asked for, for decisions and they would put forward the decisions that they thought were their best ones. And sometimes they'd get edited and before they got published. And so the system was really quite um, flawed, right? Because you didn't find out how, what the court decided and you found out what the court wanted you to think they'd decided. Here, sometimes you have the opposite problem where there is no filter. So occasionally you'll get um, decisions on there where uh, that start, someone's a court, member of the court has started to write it and not finished it. So you'll get a, uh, you, you'll get the decision template that the that the courts kind of fill in, but only half it only gets halfway, and so and you'll see um, enter sentence here, or you know enter the um, you know, aggravating or, or mitigating circumstances there. Um, it's quite funny, but yeah. So, but but, but you're right. Um, there is always going to be. Any accuracy because you don't know what what the what's been put up there, whether it's gen well, well, you know, they're all genuine decisions, but whether there there are ones that they haven't put up there, and therefore I missed it's possible. Okay, there's quite a few people on the list. Uh, Patrick, thanks, Ed. Uh, great talk. Sorry, just a quick question. Thanks. Um, Patrick Anderson. I work with Forest People's Program, a human rights group. Does a lot of work in Indonesia. Reminds me of like a couple of comments and a question. Yeah. So um, back in Gusto's day when he was president and the whole issue of corruption judici judiciary came up and he said, well, let's just bring in some Dutch judges. Mm -hmm. And of course it got shouted down and wasn't possible, but just a maverick idea. In my work with rural communities in Indonesia who lose lands to um, you know large uh, companies, oil palm companies and so on, they don't typically, they don't have recourse to the law. Mm. Uh, the, the system doesn't work. They don't have the funds. They lose the cases anyway. You know, so, so one thing 
that we do to help communities is um, there are complaints and appeals mechanisms inside the international voluntary standards for sustainability. And so we help communities to use those complaints mechanisms in some ways because there isn't a judicial means for them to, to, to seek redress, to seek remedy, mm -hmm. and to um, seek recognition of their land rights. So just a yeah, 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 yeah. judicial pathway. Um, but my question to you is, um, I know that between Australia and Indonesia, there's a lot of uh, support for uh, work inside the judiciary and with lawyers. And, you know, I'm wondering, is there much going on in this regard, but, you know, support from Australia or discussion between the judiciary on ways that mm. um, that Indonesia's judicial system can uh, unpack and make more transparent and address corruption mm. inside its judicial system? Mm. All right, there's a few things there. So, as I said, I was in Jakarta. Well, I was in Jakarta last week, yeah. and there was talk about um, about the creation of a international commercial court. So, a court that would hear only international commercial cases that were heard in Indonesia. And there was some discussion about whether it would be possible to bring in foreign judges, as occurs in places like Hong Kong. Um, you know, you need to have quite high wages to attract former judges in, and most of them are at retirement age by that stage. Um, so if age is a factor, there you go. Um, so look, it, but I, I would very much doubt that they would ever do it, not just because of the money, but because I don't know if any judge that would be able to slot into an Indonesian judicial process. Um, so there'd be there'd be a lot of resignations, I think, as soon as they uh, as they were appointed for after the first day, perhaps. What you say about the judicial system or the legal system not working for customary communities, of course, is very well known. And you know, I'm glad people like you are doing work to try and avoid the justice in commas system. But I guess one one point I would make is that even those who do have access to the justice system or the, the judicial system don't necessarily get what they get in the decision. So I was talking before about the enforcement problems um, and this is not uh, what we're talking about today, but um, foreign uh, investors who have disputes with the Indonesian government can go and have international arbitration in Singapore or wherever. Yeah. Now, I think even if you get a for, a, a, an arbitral award and then you try and enforce it in Indonesia, it's almost impossible. Yeah. So there's a lot of literature about about this. You know, people say, well, well, you know, it's, it's not bad. The arbitration system in Indonesia, the courts generally recognise arbitral awards from overseas, and that's true. But you still then need to take your order of the court and have it enforced against assets in Indonesia. Now, apparently, in, if, if it's about getting access to a bank account with, with money in it, that's not too bad, not too hard. It's possible. But if you're dealing with land or property that needs to be sold to, to meet a, a you know, foreign award, then, you know, you, you almost kind of throw up your hands and, um, and give up. In terms of judicial cooperation, I have to be careful what I say here, but In order to help Indonesia, um, there has to be an acknowledgement of, of the problems. And I think an Australian court and Australian judges would be quite reluctant to openly express what they are. So judges in Australia in particular, um, for reasons of comedy, you know, like like you know, don't like to to overly criticize um. Uh, foreign judiciaries. Um, that said, there is you know quite a lot of support for the Indonesian courts, particularly from our federal court. Our federal court has a quite a strong relationship, particularly judge to judge relationship with some Supreme Court judges. So they'll often meet and talk and you know discuss common problems, etc. Um, the other thing is it's. Yeah, quite how any court in the world could help Indonesia with its own problems, with the problems in the Indonesian judicial system. I mean, um, 
it, you know, I, I just can't see a solution coming from from outside anyway. Thank you. Actually, I'm I'm next on the list. I have, <laughs> I have two closely related For questions. So one is you said you, we're not sure really how extensive this problem is, and it's very hard to know. It could be fifty percent, could be ninety percent. So if I was like Bill Gates or something and gave you a million dollars and said go and find out, you know, what's the level of corruption in the Indonesian judiciary? How does it differ across different sorts of courts and cases? Could you find out? Actually, I I'll, 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 I'll ask that question. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I'd probably just take the million dollars. Yeah, I'm going to say. Right. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> just say, what do you want to give? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I, the number I don't have. Yeah. Is there any method you could use? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I'd be very willing to 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 hear other comments about that because right. I, I I mean it's just this massive beast the Indonesian judicial system. Right. Um. And. Yeah, uh, from time to time, the Supreme Court takes it seriously, or appears to take it seriously. So after one of its judges was um, indicted for corruption, um, it was apparently quite receptive to reform ideas. But quite how it, in the current system, could control, even if it wanted to control, judges spread across these thousand courts, monitor them. When I was thinking about this this morning, um, the, the spread of the cases that I've, I've been looking at, most of them are in Java. There are, there's a couple in Medan as well. And there's a, there, are, there are a few outliers, but you know it seems to be where the KPK is is, is watching or, or is, can easily watch, right? So you could you, you might be able to institute some reforms in Java, but then have trouble in Eastern Indonesia. I don't think any of the judges were from Eastern Indonesia. Um, so I think that's that's one of the problems. Um, some people will say, oh, you're, you're not paying judges enough, but I still don't think that's going to solve any problems um, until more judges get prosecuted. Um, but no, I, 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 I think I'd need more than a million dollars bill. <laughs> but, but also, I, wouldn't, I, I, I honestly wouldn't know where to start. I remember Dan Lev, the American scholar, um, fame, well, not famously, but um, suggesting uh, tongue in cheek that all you need to do is to bomb the Supreme Court. <laughs> that was before 9 11. Um, but, um, and he wasn't serious, obviously, but, you know, but just start again, start from scratch. Um, but yeah, the problem with starting from scratch, and again, I talk about this in my book, it's not, it's not starting from scratch as much as. Um, if there's a problem in Indonesia, often the solution chosen is to create a new court. So, so we have here all these cases from the anti-corruption courts yeah. that themselves have obviously been corrupted. Now, initially, before they were allegedly corrupted, um, so what I mean is for a while, um, you know, they had a reasonable reputation, and that was, I think, because... They would they would regularly and predictably um, convict prosecutions brought by the KPK, but then you have problems of corruption infecting that court, and it's almost inevitable that there'll be some seepage of dysfunction. So that's one of the reasons why I don't think an international commercial court, um, well, why it might not work, because if it's part of the existing judiciary. The interactions with the, the other parts of the judiciary are likely to infect it. Great, thanks. I'll put myself on the bottom of the queue for my second question. Um, another online one. Yeah, yeah. this one's from Vikram Nehru from right. John Hopkins University. It says Simon, thanks for a terrific talk, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. Could you speak a little about the hierarchy of laws? To what extent do lower courts have to adhere to precedents set by higher courts? Does the perceiving absence of such hierarchy contribute to corruption in lower courts because it allows them to ignore the precedents from higher courts? Mm. Well, thank you for that question. So we're looking at really um, the old chestnut of Indonesia and the civil law system versus the common law system. So Indonesia has a civil law system. There's no formal system of precedent. 
um, that you can compare with someone like somewhere like Australia, which has a system of precedent, and judges have to follow um, judicial decisions made by higher courts in previous cases with similar facts. Now, Indonesia, I've heard it described by Supreme Court judges as what they what was referred to as a hybrid system. So some judges will still firmly say, I can make every single case, every single decision based on the merits, based on my own reading of, of the law and the facts. But most judges would say, well, I should think about what courts have decided in the past. Now, one of the, the problems in the past has been there's been no database, so judges haven't been able to find out what courts have said in the past. Now that's less of a problem, although the, the database is a bit difficult to, to use um, from time to time. You, you, you kind of have to get lucky to find the case you're looking for, the similar case you're looking for amongst the 8 million decisions on there. Um, that said, um, I mean, if a judge wants to find a reason to favour a party, um, that's a feasible legal reason, you know, perhaps it bribed to find in favour of a particular party, then there's usually a legal argument that he or she or the panel can, can find. So I just talked about Guntur Hamza's judgment, and I think it's quite defensible. You know, you could argue that the reasons he's given are um, legally satisfactory. The problem is that the rest of the court switched in the in, in two days, um, switched to his view in two days after maintaining this reluctance to, to interfere with age limits um, for several years. So, you know, if if a, if a court wants to find a reason to decide a case in a particular way, it can do so even if it's bound by higher court decision. One point I'd also like to make about that is that the Supreme Court, so presuming that everyone can and wants to follow Supreme Court decisions, since Sato Atap, since the one, one roof policy came in and the court took over all the administration of, of the courts across Indonesia from the Ministry of Justice as it then was, I think you can see a perceptible decrease in the quality of reasoning. So these days, if I'm reading, if I have the, the uh, you know, the uh, um, uh, um, the pleasure of reading a Supreme Court judgment, I'll just jump to the last two paragraphs on the second last or third last page, which is the place where the court gives its reasons. All of the stuff before that, it may be hundreds of pages, is evidence, is procedural, it's. Um, you know, you might need to read it, but to find the nub of its decision, it's usually in two paragraphs at the end. Sometimes longer, but usually not. Now, if you go back 20, 30 years ago, you'd find two or three pages of reasoning, which is still not much by common law standards, but it's much better than two paragraphs. And often the court just decides, we're just going to give reasons why it reached its decision, not any alternative views that may have been expressed in the in the documents, um, not any kind of issues of legal interpretation, which can be quite important for future subsequent courts, um, just an explanation of, of the decision reached, very partial um, and, and very descriptive. So I guess that's a long way of me saying that even if there were, were a legal hierarchy, it wouldn't be always very useful to, to follow it. We wouldn't be able to follow it all the time because you might not be able to find out or might not be able to work out what the, the Supreme Court says in its decisions anyway. Yeah, uh, hey, uh, Mr. Project. So uh, if you look, if you compare the corruption in Indonesia with other countries, particularly in Asia and Latin America, uh, how you would rank Indonesia among those country. And but what I'm particularly concerned is that is Indonesia already uh, as bad as in a country in which problem of uh, judicial is actually influencing the ability of the country to uh, grow better. 
to what to grow better. Grow better. Yeah. Oh, look, that's probably a question for an economist, but uh, <laughs> but look, the 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 yeah, it's it's of enough concern that the um, that the Indonesian judiciary is is looking at it, and they're actually quite um, quite interested in how Indonesia ranks in the Be Ready scale, the new World Bank. Um, uh, kind of doing business yeah. um, ranking system. So they're looking at what the indicators are in relation to the judiciary and how we might, or how they might be able to better, um, uh, uh, kind of get a better ranking. But as as has as it goes in relation to comparisons with other countries, I can't really say. Sorry. Um, hi, Ross. I'm Ross McLeod from the Indonesia Project. Uh, a comment and a question, just a comment on um, Ed's, Bill Gates' question. Um, I've also worked a little bit on corruption as, uh, mm -hmm. uh, generally, not just in the legal system. And I think it's a sort of, with all due respect, it's a bit of a journalistic question to say, well, how big is it? You know, let's put a number, is it 50%, is it 30%? 30%. Plenty of political scientists work on these issues for us. Not just journalists. The question is, like, thirty percent of what? Mm, are we yeah. saying thirty percent of judges are corrupt, or are we saying thirty percent of the monetary value of uh, things that went through court uh, are subject to corrupt decisions? That's two totally different things. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I kind of think. Um, if you're trying to, to measure that, I mean, there's a lot of uh, judicial decisions that don't even talk about money. I mean, um, allowing the, the president's son to run for vice president, there's not a, there's no money amount involved there. It's uh, there's a there's a bribe involved, really. But this, uh, so my point is, this is not a legal case about you owe me a million dollars. Mm. Uh, please give me the time. Yes, so I, I just say. That's my opinion. I don't think it's very useful to be talking to be trying to quantify this particular so not sure no, it's really yeah. The only really interesting question to me is how do you fix it? Which brings me to my, my question about your book. You've done all this work of investigating this huge database. Um, I want to know the bottom line. Um, you might have classified things and compare this, uh, this uh, level of reports with that level of reports and so on. But at the end of it all, in your conclusions chapter, uh, you're going to tell me what I want to know? What can we do about this? Well, um, <laughs> by the book. Yeah, yeah by the book. <laughs> I'm sure you will anyway, Russ. So, yeah. No, look, I, I really don't know. I mean, one of the, the, the um, suggestions I settled on, or well, a couple of suggestions actually. One is, but then they're not perfect in any way. So they're all highly flawed. So one is a return to this system whereby judges have their decisions examined by other judges. But of course, the problem with that is that then, you know, the other judges who could be examining the decisions could be as bad as or worse than the judges whose decisions are being examined. Um, one of the points that I make in in this book, not regate, not necessarily related to corruption though, is about the decline in judicial reasoning, and particularly I look at I look at decisions of Alcastar, Artijo Alcastar, which I think were really problematic. So miscarriages of justice. So Jessica Wonks case. Mm -hmm. Some people might have seen the Netflix documentary. Um, and uh, the Neil Bandelman case, the Jakarta International School case, and the Ahok case, yeah. uh, and a couple of others. But in, in all of those cases, the defence put forward a very convincing arguments that just weren't considered by any of the judges going up the, the chain. Um, and... And so one of my suggestions is, well, perhaps lawyers are providing too many arguments that judges go, well, I can't handle all these. I've got seven or eight cases more that I have to handle today. That's what it is. It's like seven cases per day in the Supreme Court. I was in, I was in a judge's office last week and he had a box 
about this high off the ground, about that wide, it's full of files for one case. So you can see why judges would want would try and take shortcuts if they could. Um, but my one of my suggestions was, well, the lawyer should be limited to maybe three or four arguments, and judges must respond to those three or four arguments in their decisions. Um, but that doesn't solve the corruption problem. So I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, just more generally, what, what is the bottom? Is there a bottom line of your book? Uh, not really. Not really. Not, not in terms of corruption. No. Well, just trying to think. I, I don't. No, no, not real. Those are the those are the things that I get to. I mean, it's more pointing out the problems rather than the solutions. Maybe that's volume two, Ross. <laughs> um, okay. But but just one thing before we've got a lot more questions. So yeah, but but just one thing more. Um, the the Supreme Court has a council that it um. Uh, it convenes to hear allegations of judicial misconduct. Um, now, about 50% of cases involve sexual misconduct. That's what they focus on. There are a few cases of corruption, but in almost all of those cases, a judge might receive a written admonishment, a written, you know, but firm, uh, firm statement against what they've done and a warning not to do it again. Sometimes they might be suspended, but they're almost never referred on to the criminal system. So it's a, a way of diverting judges from ordinary criminal process. So for some reason, these 27 judges that I look at in this book, 27, yeah, that are done for corruption, um, managed to... Um, aggregate ag aggravate someone in the Supreme Court such that they couldn't kind of make make use of that process instead of the criminal trial. So it's not as simple as finding a uh, finding a bottom line. It's as because I don't know if there is one at this point. Um, but there were lots of problems that I've identified in the book that I don't think are widely discussed. Um, I was wondering if you have some insights on if you're looking at the bottom of chain, the entire bottom of chain, where is still the biggest problem at the court level, court, court stage, or the initial state investigation stage, or the prosecution stage? I've been looking at uh, enforcement in the wildfire cases mm -hmm. um, with companies and uh, real farming companies and villagers. And what I found is that once the case gets to the court, the court basically sides on the government, on the, so they actually, the, the results are actually, uh, that the companies are at fault, like mm -hmm. both in the criminal cases and in the civil lawsuits. So about 90% of the civil lawsuits always are for the uh, Ministry of Court mm -hmm. Um. So, but if you trace the, the cases, the, the prior cases, um, for instance, when they seized the land, the you know, they were seized the land, seized, um, what do you call that? Um, and not that. allowed to operate anymore because of the because of the, the fires. You have you see more, a lot more than actually what go to court, what went to court. So that's the so. What so I, kind of an informal, well, a, a more of an administrative so decision to cancel the license. Uh, no, no, this is different. This is different. This is when you know when the when there's fire, when there's fire yeah. within the concession is there, the police start investigating, right? But then they do kind of get lost in the in the process of, of, of enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them get lost, but once they get to the court, then the court then they're 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 criminalized, they're penalized, most of them, you know, like basically. Mm -hmm. So my question is. Uh, whether where is the problem in the enforcement um, chain that you see most? Is it really in the court stage or the initial stages? Oh, I, I don't think. And, and, and just to warn you, we're almost out of time, and we have a few more questions. All right. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> to make it short, I I I can't I can't say there's no general um, point at which I think the enforcement is the problem, um, and it depends on the type of case. Um, I mean, your your sample is. Um, I mean, when you say police enforcement, do you mean 
investigation. Yeah, starting. So, so if if, if there's an if there's an intervention in the in the mafia, if there's a payment paid, it would happen at the at the police stage. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. What so you're... what I'm saying is that because you mentioned corruption here, I did. Yeah, yeah. So what yeah. about the other? Because that means that the, the process has started and then it gets to the court stage and you're, you're looking at the problem there but i'm just wondering if you have some insight not that. really not not on the police investigation no, stage yeah. i mean it's well known that police are and it's, it's always tricky to um make generalizations but you know the police are um <laughs> how do i put it yeah, yeah. That's a subject for another book. yeah that's right but um once it gets to trial, though, it's there's a whole new level of, of players and publicity, um, and you've got prosecutors involved in that as well. I thought you were going to ask me more about, you know, the, the end result, the, the enforcement aspect, where you might have to get the police involved. And it reminds me of this debate in Indonesia at the moment about criminalisation, you know, people who are involved in a civil dispute one of the parties goes to the police and tries to report them for, for something might be related to the dispute, might be something else entirely in order to get leverage um, in, in, in that civil dispute, which, you know, it's the police, misuse of the police system in order to, to get an advantage in a civil dispute. A few more quick, a quick round of rapid questions oh, and answers to try and finish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, David, over to you. Uh, originally from Canberra, but I'm a journalist based uh, in Singapore at the Straits Time. So I have a lot of exposure with Indonesia, and particularly on the energy policy side. Mm. Um, just to pick up uh, my friend's comment, they're all journalistic questions. I think quantifying the scale of the problem is quite useful. Uh, obviously, you've identified many problems with the judicial system. So whether it's quantifying the scale of the problem in terms of money, in terms of percentage of problem cases, do you find that quite a useful way, or is it possible? Because you need to figure out, if you're going to understand a problem, you need to quantify it in some way, and also readers, if they're going to, if you, you know, to see the media, you know, they need to understand some way to compare as to what, how large a problem is, right? Mm. That's more of a comment. Uh, and this, but the question is, you have identified lots, lots of problems. Are there any areas that you're seeing uh, hope for improvement? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, not, not, not really. Um, in fact, I can see, look, look, people say that, and I don't know if this is true, that corruption was bad under Sahara. It's worse now because there's less of a centralised system. Um, but now we may be seeing a move towards a more central, you know, towards a more centralised system. In which case, we may see interference from government increasing, but maybe corruption might go down. So who, who, who knows? I'm just just going to speak poorly on that one. But I can't actually see um, with the constitutional court dying, seems to be dying. Um, I can't see anything getting much better anytime soon. That's a quick fire answer. Good on you, yeah. Do you have a very brief third version of your question? Oh, I was just interested in your comment on the decline of quality decisions and what you thought might be the cause behind that. You've already made uh, subsequent comments on reasonable suppressions, perhaps being a part of it. I guess I was wondering if there might also be shifts in legal education, um, perhaps shifts away from a hybrid system where there were more common law influences for the practice of whether stronger civil law education and an influence on what other courses might be behind that. But I'm happy to. Maybe we'll talk, take that one offline. Yeah. All right, let me ask the final question oh, yeah. then. <laughs> I mean, you said it's the, I think you described your your talk as being on the problem of corruption in the judicial system. You say not quite sure how much there is, but there's a lot. Given that, do you think, does Indonesia have a functioning rule of law? <laughs> you, want to, you, want to, you want to share the answer? No, not now. Not now. <clears throat> Not now. Not right. Well, we've had two very non uplifting ways to finish the <laughs> seminar, but we I'm sure you'll all agree that it's been really uh, enlightening. So, yeah. uh, which is what we would expect uh, from a talk from Simon. So, thanks so much for making Thank the you. trip down, and uh, we look forward to.
reading the book. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.